Welcome back to the Christ and Culture, guys. This is Clint. And this is Gordon. And this week we are joined with another special guest, Leah Murphy from Life Teen. Hi, hi, hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Leah, you want to tell people just who you are and a little yeah. bit about Life Teen? Because it's surprising a lot of people have never heard of Life Teen still. So we got to get Wild. that out. Yeah, the people need to know. <laughs> um, yes, so I am Life Teen's Coordinator of Digital Evangelization and Outreach. I serve on our resource development team with a bunch of really amazing ministry professionals. But basically what Life Teen is, is we are a youth ministry movement. And what we are dedicated to doing as an organization is leading teens closer to Christ. What that looks like for us specifically is creating the best resources in Catholic youth ministry, which empower passionate Catholics to become authentic and fearless evangelists. So we create curriculum and resources that youth ministers at Catholic churches can use around the world to run youth ministry at their churches. So basically, the goal with that is to cut out the the heavy lifting of writing curriculum, writing life night or youth nights. Which is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) That's the hope. And so we just want to cut out that heavy lifting so that youth ministers are empowered to be in authentic relationship with their teenagers because Mm. we believe that authentic relationship, um, authentic conversations, authentic connections, those are what lead people to true encounters with Jesus. And so that's what we're all about. Um, As the coordinator of digital evangelization and outreach, my particular role is dedicated to facilitating those authentic connections and relationships in the digital space. So a lot of what I do concretely is working with our blog, working with our social media, doing a, a decent bit of video work as well, and really trying to live in this digital space that so much of the culture lives in and um, offer opportunities for teens and youth ministers to really connect and be empowered on their faith journeys as they become authentic and fearless evangelists. I have one question on what you just said. Yes. Uh, So you used a word that I was just talking to Clint about with this movie that we talked about in a second, but authentic relationships. Yes. What is the challenge with keeping authentic relationships in the digital world? My favorite question. This is like my current soapbox and I get fired up. There are so (laughs) many limitations to the digital world and the digital space. And I think that ultimately what it comes down to is that what happens in the digital world is authentic connections are made and there's an opportunity for that. It's like a, a gate to authentic relationships, but I don't know. The more I think about it, the more I like, I, this is still kind of like in thought process Mm. for me, but at this point in my life, the more I think about it, I don't think a person can have an authentic relationship purely on in a digital way. I think it's dehumanizing to assume that we could just because there is so much missing. And a lot of that comes down to the idea of just like conversation and thought and discourse and how um, how limited we become in all of that in the digital space. And while there is the opportunity to exchange information and exchange thought, it's very different to like, uh, everyone talks about like the most violent debates happening on Twitter. Like it's very easy to be in like a, really offensive debate on Twitter but if you're sitting like across the table from someone who asks you questions about like your faith or your belief or your opinions that takes on a much different form and I would say is more human and I would say is a more authentic relationship you know so I think we can't assume too much of the digital space and what it really needs to be especially for like evangelization is a gate to that authentic relationship which doesn't take place purely digitally yeah okay so I, would no go ahead. I was just gonna say I love that you said that because we literally were just talking about that with uh, John Blevins last yes, week. Yes, I on listened his... to it. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Yeah, and I um, safe space. Yeah, and I love his commitment to like, and I I believe in this wholeheartedly that the digital space is like a space for pre-evangelization. This is not like where you're gonna sit down with someone and be like, right. let me tell you about the person of Jesus, and we're gonna unpack like your past and like move you into this. First of all, whatever I was just saying is just not a way to speak to someone. (laughs) But like pre-evangelization is what happens digitally. That's where like 
you express that most important message that you are loved infinitely. God believes you're worth dying for. And then like moves beyond like whatever platform you're on Mm. into something more real. Anyways, those are just my musings. I don't know what they're worth, but. (laughs) It's great. It's great. That's, that's awesome. So you mentioned a lot of different resources that you guys do as life team. And I, I, I don't think it's, it's just for youth ministers. Like it's not just for us. It's not just for the core members. And one of the big ones that I really enjoy that you guys have just made super public is the Life Teen Parent Life uh, website. So I think that's awesome. I use that to try and stay up to date on stuff. And I think that is like really, really good. So you want to talk about that a little bit so that some of our listeners know what that is? Yes. So a woman on my team, amazing, Amanda Grubbs, she's our edge support coordinator. So she leads the charge on all our middle school youth ministry resources. But she also took on Parent Life, which is this subsection of our website, which is dedicated to serving parents of Catholic teenagers. And she has done an incredible job of identifying that the real need of Catholic parents, of parents of Catholic teenagers is not so much to know like how to pray with their teens or how to um, understand where they're at, like spiritually or um, how to like lead a Bible study with their, what parents really need is to know what their teens and what their generational cohort is like dealing with, because Mm -hmm. there's so much that Gen Z, first of all, what Gen Z is going through right now is just changing at such a rapid rate that it's just hard to keep up with for anyone. It's astonishing that members of this generation can keep up with it. I think that's um, why it's so daunting for them. Like they feel so overwhelmed by it. Yeah. And, um, and, and so it, it just is a, a huge task to try to understand what teens are coming up against, what they're getting excited about, what they believe is cool, good, trendy, what they believe is bad, nerdy stupid um and so yeah amanda had the brilliant idea of like really tailoring this content to equip parents to understand their teens and what they're experiencing and so yeah she's done a great job uh working with a bunch of different writers and getting all kinds of input on crazy things i wrote a blog about like what a hashtag is for parents (laughs) who don't understand what hashtags are um we have a blog about um about like standing celebrities and what that means and, and, and why, <laughs> why teens do it and why, and just kind of like the tribe mentality behind that. We have a monthly like culture update blog, which I work I on. Um, yeah, it's super fun. We, so this is a cool like collaborative process at Life Teen. I, I run these monthly culture update meetings, which is just with a few of our staff members and we just cover different areas of teen culture and talk about what's happening there. And we've been inviting teens into these meetings too. So they'll present like to us, like what's cool in music, what's cool in television and movies and, and what's cool with, and what's cool and what's not cool. Anyways, a whole bunch of different areas of teen culture. And then following those meetings, that all gets kind of summarized up into the parent life blog, which is written to inform parents on, on maybe not what their particular son or daughter is experiencing, but what what their son or daughter's peers are experiencing or mm-hmm. what's going on mm-hmm. in general. So anyways, that's parent life. Thanks for asking about it. It's a really cool resource and Amanda's done a great job with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If, if people want to find it, what's the, the web address for that one? Yes, I believe it's, I'm going to confirm this. It is ltparentlife.com. Okay. You can also get to it through lifeteen.com if that's easier but lt parent life is the direct cool. and yeah all of our all of our stuff is there we'll put a link to it in the in the description too so if you guys want to Amazing. check that out i highly encourage it wow. so that was actually something that i i just heard about at cymc for the first time cool uh, and that was the first time that I got to meet you. Shout out to Patrick Nevy for introducing what a us. Pal. Yeah, Patrick. <laughs> you great. podcasters, you're so cool. I know. I know. Well, <laughs> we're not. We are not nearly <laughs> at that level. Faces behind a microphone. <laughs> <That's about it. laughs> um, yeah. So CYMC was awesome. I, I love that conference. And you and Ryan gave this breakout session mm-hmm. that as soon as I saw the title of it, I knew I had to go. So it was yeah. the modern Areopagus mm-hmm. affirming the good in teen culture. 
so do you want to just give us like the spark note synopsis of of that talk yes i would love to first of all ryan mcquade is just I mean, we're co-workers, but we're also best friends. So it was just a delight <laughs> to work on that with him. We lovingly referred to it as our recital, not our breakout session, because <laughs> any opportunity to perform is, we're just ridiculous. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so the Modern Areopagus is, was a, a talk basically addressing the fact that as youth ministers, because CYMC was mostly youth ministers, core members, that kind of thing. Um, we have to address and confront the reality that we exist in a different culture than the teens we serve. And so there's a huge cultural divide when it comes to youth ministry. And failing to be honest about that and failing to equip ourselves in that is ultimately going to uh, damage our efforts or or limit our efforts in serving teenagers. And so we used the story of St. Paul at the Areopagus in Acts 17 as kind of the basis for a lot of our thought on this, um, which, so it's a story about Acts. He's in, in Greece, I believe. Yeah, he's at Athens. Yes. Thank you. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> I don't want to get this wrong. And yeah, and he is encountering all these people of different faiths, different, um, really people with uh, different thoughts and ideas. And and he starts talking about the gospel and they're like, hey, we want to know more. So he goes into the Areopagus. This is the place of like discourse where like thought is exchanged and people talk, <laughs> talk about. I, all I, I love you guys. You guys called it the Twitter of ancient Greece. I think exactly. what you guys, <laughs> it was great. That was all Ryan. He's oh, brilliant. Nice, um, nice. But yeah, it was it was just where. Everyone is just exchanging all different kinds of ideas. And so Paul goes in and there's something really worth noting about the way he engages with these people. Um, he starts by addressing the fact and, and affirming the fact that they're very religious, that these are people who, who have like a religious impulse and he admires that. He talks about their art and, and kind of the beauty that surrounds them. And he like sees them and listens to them. And then once he addresses all that, he acknowledges or, or draws their attention really to the fact that that they are worshiping an unknown God, but that he knows the God that they are striving for and want to know. And um, and so kind of looking at that as an example, we, we really use this time to encourage youth ministers to engage with teen culture in the same way, to start out by observing like Paul observes the Athenians and, and take in what's going on around them and then see that good, like see where, where Paul could affirm the, religiousness of this community like where are we as youth ministers seeing the the religiousness or the good or the holy or the true in teen culture um and then affirming that in it and, mm. and then um and identifying those places where where we ultimately see god you know so paul he talks about how there is this unknown god but he he knows that that's really god he sees the lord there and that we as youth ministers have that same opportunity and sh should respond to that inclination that there are probably areas of teen culture where many would assume like god doesn't exist there god isn't working there but if we have hearts for the lord and and are eager to encounter him in that space we have to trust that he's working there and even if it takes the shape of an unknown god we who know that God can identify him. And mm -hmm. if we can identify him, we can empower teens to identify him within their own culture. And that's what empowers them to transform culture. And that's what empowers them to live as authentic, fearless evangelists. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do here too. Uh, you broke it down into the, the three steps of like affirming what is mm -hmm. good, ob observing where Christ is in that. And then yes. I think the, the third step you all used was the proclaiming hope and call yeah. to repentance. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do here too. Gordon, feel free to, feel free to interject. Yeah, no, it just, I don't want to repeat again, but it reminds <laughs> me of, remind me of the Belevins episode where he talks about like youth ministers that don't know what like Twitch or Fortnite yeah. is. And he's like, I just, it just like, baffled him he's like you need to know these things because your kids that's what they're right. doing that's what they're playing that's what that's what yeah. they're missing youth group for yeah it yeah it's hard like it's it's exhaust i'm not exhausting that sounds so dramatic but it's really <laughs> I, like i admire so much what youth ministers who really like respond to this task do because like this is 
a huge part of my full-time job is to like study up on these things. So in addition to like running life nights and retreats and all of that, and then taking on the responsibility of understanding teen culture, that's a huge task, but it is, it's so necessary. Another like analogy that Ryan and I used in that breakout is just kind of like the analogy of like going on a foreign mission that there Mm. is that you have to like, there's a lot of work that has to be done in order to effectively engage with a culture that's not your own. And we think about that very naturally with things mm-hmm. like foreign missions, but I don't think we think about it as naturally as we should with, uh, with the domestic mission of teen culture, because it is different and we have to study and understand and know and respect those differences. Yeah. I'm, I'm picturing like with current culture, it's uh kids heads are in multiple directions Mm. and the struggle is youth ministers are trying to like physically turn their heads to like the cross and the kids are fighting that rather than like forging new lenses just like place over the kids eyes to where everything they see is a cross what an image what an image i love that yeah yeah That's that's awesome really good yeah no i think you're right so I don't, I don't want to steal a whole bunch from from your talk at uh, at CYMC, but there is one thing I wanted to bring up really quick. So I think it fits mm-hmm. right into here. So I'm going to be really awkward and directly quote you <laughs> <laughs> because because I am I am that guy when it comes to these conferences. Like I take notes on like everything. Oh, that's um, amazing. So this is I don't I don't remember if it was you or Ryan that said this, but it's not about using their culture to get them to God, but rather finding God where he already is in their culture. Find and celebrate the good, true and beautiful, even if it's unfamiliar. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's that kind of summarizes exactly what we're trying to get to here. Mm-hmm. And that's like I said, that's what we're trying to do on this show, too. So right. I think that's really important. Yeah. And guys, I'm going to put all of these steps and stuff that we're talking about in the notes because there's there's a lot of stuff. So just check the notes section and you can find all of this good stuff. But Leah, like I told you ahead of time, one of the things we do on this show is talk about the media that we're taking in and, and yeah. we kind of share that with people. So Gordon, do you want to go ahead and start us off so you can uh, lead sure. example? Yeah, to kind of close out the summer because we've had interns with us all summer with the door. We as a team are reading The Return of the Prodigal Son by mm. Henry Nouwen. Um, so I just guy. started that. Um, I've read some of his other books, but I haven't read this one. I've, I've heard people rave about it. Yeah. And then I watched on Netflix a really weird, short, dark comedy mockumentary. It's like 32 <laughs> minutes. It's a one shot. It's with the guy from Stranger Things that plays ha- um, ha- Harper. It's called Frankenstein's Monsters Monster Frankenstein. It was what? It was weird. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it was like 32 minutes, and I was like, "There's no other episodes." I'm just gonna watch it. Yeah, I binged it. Technically speaking, (laughs) (laughs) it was a 30 minute binge. Oh man. Um, And then I saw last night instead of watching Lion King, like I was said I was going to, I went and saw (laughs) Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because of uh, desires and priorities. In Tarantino. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? I did. I liked it a lot. Yeah, I'm a little biased, but I loved it. <laughs> do you love Quentin Tarantino? He's obsessed. I, I do. I own like everything he has done. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. I don't really like. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's okay. Uh, it's, he's like he's like you Not hate him everyone. or you love him. Yeah. No, there's no middle ground. <laughs> it's true. He's very polarizing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome though. Uh, Leah, do you have any stuff you're taking in right now? Yes. Ugh. So of many course. things. Okay, first of all, Chance the Rapper's new album is ridiculous. Did you know he's in Lion King? Yes, yeah. And I, I, don't I just found really, out last night. Yeah, it was a weird thing. Like someone was like, "Yeah, you'll not even recognize that he's there," and I, mm. I didn't. So, mm. <laughs> so yeah, that album is awesome. Just like wild collaboration that I deeply mm. admire, and I just love his free expression of his faith in the midst of like explicit songs like I just think not that I'm like in favor of let's have all the songs be explicit but I just love Chance and his authenticity Mm -hmm. um Chance the Rapper what else oh I'm reading a book about spiritual gifts and also a book by James Baldwin the both of the titles are escaping me at this moment (laughs) but 
they're very they're very interesting uh, yeah i think the first one it's the spiritual gifts handbook by mary healy and oh, okay. randy clark and then this james baldwin book i don't remember what it is called something about fire but there are two pieces by him within this book the first one is a letter to his nephew um, and the second one is an essay and it's just all about his experience as a black man in Harlem in the 40s and and just his just confronting racism and can I go on a tangent for a minute yeah this will take more than a minute but <laughs> <laughs> but it's just I think it's worth it um talking about like good media because it's a collision of like all these things I'm taking in for sure so the first part that the letter to his nephew I first heard about it because there's this artist Jamila Woods who I really enjoy she's a musician and she put out an album a few months ago and each track on the album is named after a certain person and the Baldwin track is is about James Baldwin and it's about this letter in particular it's about this letter that James Baldwin wrote to his nephew hmm. and a few weeks ago my coworker and friend Stephanie Espinosa she sent me the link to this podcast about with Jamila talking about like why she wrote that track, what it's about, that kind of thing. Mm. And she talks about how she read this letter, James Baldwin to his nephew about how like basically that confronting racism is not about. And I, and I really would encourage people to read it because I do think that like, I, I might fail to express this well, <laughs> um, but that confronting racism as a black man is about loving radically and that it's about accepting people. It, it's not about like getting people to accept you, but accepting people in their flaws and like bringing them to a deeper understanding of what humanity is about basically. And it's the same as the Christian mission. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and James Baldwin has like a really wild past with like religion and he was like a, a pastor for a little while. Anyways, um so listening to that podcast got me really fired up. Picked up this book and was just like, "Oh my word, it's just beautiful." Um because y- you you just like hear this this sense of of love and like really paternal care for um his nephew in this letter and it's all oriented towards combating the the evil of racism in a radical way and so anyways so that's kind of what i'm taking in right now and then of course i saw the lion king last night loving beyonce's music her curated <laughs> album for it all the things so nice yeah. uh i just looked it up it's the fire next time is that thank you <laughs> yes. okay. i suppose i could have used the google maker but no. <laughs> it's wow. all good it's all good <laughs> I, I've been taking in an unhealthy amount of media this week, so I'm going to just go really briefly. One of my roommates got me started on an anime. I don't really watch a lot of anime, but mm-hmm. this is like an American one, and he asked me to sit down and watch it with him. And as soon as I, I w- started watching, I recognized a bunch of the characters are really famous like cosplay characters that mm. I've seen at like cons before because I'm a little bit of a geek, so I, I, I've, I've seen all that stuff. And so I ended up watching the first five seasons or six seasons all this week and I just destroyed it and it was it was really unhealthy um <laughs> but then I've just been going through so much music this week too so mm. I've gone through the Hamilton soundtrack the new love. Ed Sheeran album that came out which I love Ed Sheeran but he's starting to move away from my kind of uh oh. music a little bit so th- this new one is all collaborations it's yeah. called a number mm-hmm. five collaborations project and there's a couple of them in there that are really, really good, but it, it threw me off because the very first song is called Beautiful People, and it's all about how, like, no matter how much money they have and they go to all these parties and stuff, like, they might look beautiful on the outside, but they don't feel beautiful on the inside. And it's talking about, like, the celebrity life. And then the very next oh. song is a collaboration that's all about, like, we got to go make this money and, like, go party and stuff. It's like Stop. you just flip-flopped from, from one <laughs> aspect to the other, and it kind of just threw me off. And then I was listening to Janet Devlin. She's one of my favorite Irish singers. I've just Ooh. been on an Irish kick, listening Love to that. the High Kings, all kinds of stuff. And then John Bellion. Love. Uh, yeah. Love John Bellion. He's fantastic. And then throwing in a little bit of country, a little bit of Thomas Rhett, too. So okay. I've been literally all over the place as far as music. And then you mentioned Halsey, so I was uh, <sighs> binging her, too. So 
Did Lots you enjoy of any of her stuff in particular? I, I did you not? <laughs> okay, no, honest, did honest hot takes. No, I, yeah. I did have a few. <laughs> to be honest, I hadn't really listened specifically just to Halsey mm -hmm. before this week. Because, you know, like, she's got plenty of songs that are, like, top hits and oh, stuff. Oh, for sure. But I don't think I'd ever, like, really listened before. Yeah. So I remember there was a few, but I was driving, so I, I couldn't okay. tell you what they sure. were called. Yeah. But I'll... I'll message them to you. I like I, how I Butterfly, I, whenever I think about her, I just get so excited. <laughs> she's awesome. Yeah, no, she's, That's she's great. Good. I'm glad you're I, listening. I, there were some of them that I was just like, ooh, this one is kind of, uh, and then there were some yeah. that were just like, oh, that's that's really, really good, really touching. Yeah. Stuff. And the last one with uh, with the episode of Bearded Blevins coming out last week, I watched the World Cup for Fortnite this weekend. That's wild that that's the thing. Who won? I know. A 16-year-old. 16-year-old, yeah, three million dollars. Shout out. Uh, his name is uh, what's his username? It was Buga, B-U-G-H-A. Shout out, Buga. Shout out. What a time to be. Apparently, alive. he got verified <laughs> by the end of the day on on Twitter. He went from like a nobody to like huge. Yeah, I don't know what I'd do with. And okay, a 13-year-old won nine hundred thousand. He ended up in like tenth place and got. Nine hundred thousand. Can you imagine what wow. you do with nine hundred thousand dollars at thirteen? Oh, I'd be God. buying like Slim movies, Slim Jims. Slim Jims. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a weird grocery list for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, that's that's what I was taking in. I think we got a pretty wide variety. But as as you guys mentioned, the thing we're gonna be talking about today is the new Lion King movie. Yes. And some of the songs in there too. So, <laughs> fun fact: the the original. Came out the week I was born. Whoa! Yeah. That was yeah. That's awesome. I know. That's my claim to fame right there. Wow. So, Lion King. Hopefully, by this point, you guys have had 25 years to go watch the original. So, you're going to know <laughs> the, the gist of the story. But Spoilers, the, there, though. They're coming. I, I know. If you have <laughs> this, there were a few things that were kind of a little different in this one. We'll, we'll get into it. <laughs> did you enjoy it? I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I went into it and I'd heard mixed things. And the thing that I kept hearing over and over was with this animation, they have really stayed true to like, like what animals actually look like. So we lose mm. a lot of like the emotive reactions that existed in the original animated one. And so I went in and I was like, I'm not going to feel a thing. I'm just going to, it's going to feel like a nature documentary or something. But <laughs> I laughed. I cried like a child. I, <laughs> I reacted. <laughs> I yeah. thought it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. Are you I thought it was good lover? too. Um, here's my thing. I'm not like a super animal person, but whenever I see creatures on screens, I like, like I put them in the place of like my, my family's puppy, which is <laughs> weird like it could be a cat or a dog or tiger or a bear a and I just like yeah I just picture little Romeo and um and so so seeing Simba in turmoil was basically the same as seeing Romeo my puppy in turmoil and that was very sad to me I see nice. that makes sense yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I thought it was pretty good it always throws me off when they're talking about these uh live action but they're really mm -hmm. just 100 percent animated still right yeah uh, <laughs> it's very confusing yeah but I, I thought it was good oh, as live action as you can get mm -hmm. I think. right another thing i heard is that because it's live action is that they couldn't do a lot of the over a top like animations like the scene mm -hmm. from the original just can't wait to be king where they had the animal stack i love that i oh. don't know if they did that or not no. but i'm assuming mm -hmm. they made it like realistic yeah, yeah. It, it was a chase scene instead um, mm -hmm. But I, I think they did well with that. That didn't bother me because yeah. I knew that coming in. I I thought this one was more openly spiritual. To I be totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. Which yes. makes doing this so much easier. Yes. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree and just loved that. The whole time I was like, this is like a commentary on nihilism and relativism <laughs> in a movie. <laughs> and, um, we were talking about that before the show. Were you? Yeah. yeah me and Gordon were going. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Love that. I'm glad we're on the same page. This is oh, me too. Me too. This is delightful. So before we we dive into this, <laughs> I I love bringing names into into things. So mm -hmm. I I double checked because I I knew all of the names in this movie had meaning. 
So yeah. I want to throw that out there before we get started because I, oh I think that might influence things a little bit. So first off, Mufasa. Uh-huh. Uh, th- these are all Swahili uh, cool. names. Mufasa means king, Amazing. right? So from the very beginning, we have like this king figure. Simba literally means lion. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the same way that the word or the name Adam means humanity, uh, I, I see like this this lion figure representing all of lion kind and also like all of all of us mm-hmm. uh, as mankind uh, kind of carrying over. And then Pumba means fool. And then the last one is Rafiki, which is probably the biggest one that I want to point out actually means mm-hmm. uh, friend. Oh, yeah. And that. Rafiki, Rafiki's huge. Yeah. So looking, looking through that, let's, let's just talk about, the movie a little mm-hmm. bit so like i said everyone should be familiar with with the story <laughs> at, at this point do you have any like just first thoughts on on anything that stood out yeah i think the biggest thing that stood out to me i mean kind of like what what we were talking about just a moment ago just how m- much more spiritual this version seemed than the first mm-hmm. uh, i think the whole story the narrative really hinges on the idea of like what the circle of life is and Mm. the fact that like we all are interconnected and and that like what we do affects people affects each other affects animals in this case but um but for the sake of like a, a a story or a tale that we take something away from I think really like the the big takeaway for me was that what we do in this life has an impact on mm-hmm. on people in ways we might not anticipate or recognize. And this really came to life for me in in Simba's little escape from his destiny when he like goes off into into the little oasis with Timon and Pumbaa, yeah. which I feel like I can equate to like my quarter life crisis where I just was like, "Duh, I don't know how to be a good Christian. I'm leaving this all behind," which is so <laughs> dramatic. It was not that intense but but I feel like everybody has these like crisis points where we're like I'm done like trying to like strive for this thing I'm gonna go do my own thing by myself anyways and when he goes into this little oasis Timon and Pumbaa when they're talking about Hakuna Matata and like that whole idea they talk about you know they make the comparison like life is is a straight line you're just like going through what you do doesn't like it doesn't Doesn't matter and I think Timon says straight up, he says, life doesn't matter or something along those lines. Um, yeah. So I, I actually have the quote on that. If you want me to go it out. off. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, Simba is talking about the circle of life because he mm-hmm. was taught about the circle of life growing yeah. up and he, he brings it to these guys who, like you said, are like clearly playing the relativistic nihilistic characters mm-hmm. in the story. Yeah. And Pumbaa is like, life isn't a circle. It's a line, a meaningless line. And one day we'll each reach the end of that line and that's it. And you can really do whatever you want because your line doesn't affect anyone else's line. Yeah. A circle would mean what I do affects that thing, affects that thing, affects that thing, which would make doing whatever you want really not cool. (laughs) And then Timon comes in and is like, let me simplify this. Life is meaningless. That's why you got to just look out for yourself. That's why you do you, Simba. And they literally yes. use you, you do, do you. you. That killed me. I was like, what? Wow. Yeah. So oh that goodness. that's that that whole scene. I was just like, this yeah. is perfect. Yes. <laughs> well, because um, it's just it it makes so wildly clear what I think Jesus made wildly clear that. There, like there is such a thing as morality and there is such a thing as right and wrong. And there is such a thing as, as a spiritual connection with each other because we are, and I know there's like issues with this and because it is animals, but we are human beings and we have been created in God's divine image and likeness. And, and that requires something of us that requires us to recognize that, our life is not meaningless. And um, despite our efforts to believe that it is or act like it is, even when we escape from the meaning of our life, the way Simba escaped from his destiny, that affects people, you know, like he left his, the, the lions behind. And so Scar was able to 
reign in a tyrannical way and it just becomes problematic even if we're we're it, I mean it's the whole idea of like do whatever you want as long as it doesn't, it doesn't hurt anybody and um but it does it does yeah. or not. exactly because if we're doing whatever we want we're not taking into account the impact that we have on everyone we're connected to right I kind of think about with what they're talking about I kind of think about like way back in the day when people thought the earth was flat I mean mm -hmm. there's still people that think that but oh, it's just yeah. because it is. The, it's just because it we can't see that it's mm. round like if you yes. look it looks like a straight line right but right. if we walk then we end up on the other side of the earth and we just mm -hmm. went like a curve around and it's like this mm -hmm. thing it's like life if you think about it like the way that think they're thinking about it that makes sense right like it does make sense that we can live our whole life and nothing happened and we just reach the end and it's over right but and we don't we yeah, go ahead. We see that in, in like a couple scenes later, they're talking about the stars, and it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Timon and Pumbaa have like these strictly like scientific answers yes. for for the stars, and Simba is like, "Well, that's where the kings look over us." Which for me, the kings is like talking about the the ancestors, talking about the saints, right, looking mm -hmm. over us, interceding mm -hmm. for us, and they're like, "That's ridiculous!" Like it's clearly yeah. like the scientific answer, and, and nothing else beyond that. Right. But, I, I think the big thing is later on in the movie when they return to Pride Rock, mm -hmm. Simba looks back at them and is like, what happened to life being just this line? Uh -huh. And they're like, I think it was Timon that was like, I am comfortable admitting when Pumbaa is wrong. And this is one of those times. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there might be a slight curve to this line. Yeah. Right? And so they're, they're admitting. And this whole scene that we talked about before, it's so obvious that they're like, parodying this relativism concept mm -hmm. like they're they're making it obvious like this is a ridiculous belief right. uh, which is something that's kind of crazy for a hollywood kind of yeah film it's also but, really sad because mm -hmm. honestly speaking i can safely say if i was in this world i would be hanging out with timon and pumbaa oh, for the sure. whole time yeah mm -hmm. and so it's, it's just paradise it's you yeah you want <laughs> i know I and so like growing up, I me mean, like I would be with them, and then like this like turning that on its head of like, well, this is what like they right. they would actually be saying. And you're like, oh crap. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little indicting. Yeah. I also I think um, I mean really running with this analogy and the way it plays out in our in this world, I feel like it's hard to fault the mentality of Timon and Pumbaa because they, I, I mean, this is this is kind of what I garnered from the world that was presented in the movie. They they were just looking to like not get eaten and to like <laughs> maintain some sense of comfort. And, you know, like I think that's something nobody on this earth is avoiding. I think everybody's at some level striving for a, a level of comfort and and they found like safety and security. And oh wow, this this gets me thinking about Gen Z and like how much they like are striving for security and just knowing everything's going to be okay. They just want to know that like, they're not going to die, you know? <laughs> and, um, and yeah. Timon and Pumbaa, like the, the solution to that problem is to determine that, that life is meaningless. And that like, even if, if, if they step away from like the bravery that they might be called to, to like protect themselves, they, they're going to do that because they want to stay protected. And, but then like, there's, I love that Nala, a queen, a female, is the one who calls Simba into his bravery and calls him back into... Mary. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Um, but into owning owning his destiny and, and letting go of security in order to do what he was created to do. Mm. And I, I think it's important to recognize, too, we see in the song Hakuna Matata and in Lion King One and a Half, if you guys have seen that one. <laughs> Uh, I haven't seen it, but oh, okay. Yeah. So that's like, I have seen the one and a half. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's like Tim, Timon's backstory, and Got so it. we see in both of those stories that what brought Timon and Pumbaa to where they were was a lot of hurt mm -hmm. and a lot of brokenness and a lot of rejection mm -hmm. from their family and friends, and so we see like what happens when this lack of community like just tears you apart, mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of drove them into this this oasis where they. They they talked about um, what what did they say in this one? Like when when the world turns its back on you, you turn the back your back on the world. Yeah. And 
it, they kind of created this like tough facade and that's yeah. where the rest of this came from I think was from yeah. that hurt and I think that's important to remember too is that mm-hmm. when we have these deferring positions or, or like uh, ways of thinking a lot of that comes from previous hurt that kind of oh, brought yeah. us down that road too and I think that's yeah. something we overlook a lot uh-huh. agree wholeheartedly Gordon you had a really good thought before recording based off of what you heard from this weekend i think that fits pretty well here if you want to yeah so we have large group formation with a door once a month where we just kind of like talk about different subjects and last month in june uh, we talked about what it meant to be authentic and then what what authenticity was and what submission was Mm -hmm. and not like authenticity in the way we know it but like authenticity with god and mm. so like authenticity is how you or this how it was defined to us was how you respond <clears throat> to the call to mission because it was it, we're it's all about like mm-hmm. the missionary lifestyle and yeah. like authenticity is a collection of choices we, we must make every day mm-hmm. and so i think what timon and pumbaa are doing now is actually secular authenticity they're they're like i'm just being mm. myself mm. Like, being authentic but the overall story of Lion King came up in that conversation of like, this is a perfect story of authenticity because, you know, once Simba comes back and they realize he's alive and they're like, you yeah. need to be king. Right. And he's like, no, I don't want to be king. Like I wanted to, but now I don't want to, even though yeah. that is his call. Right. Um, and we do that. We're like, I don't want to do that. This is what I want to do now. And it's not until the end where he's like, he, he actually humbles himself you know, mm-hmm. let's go of the pride, pride rock, all that stuff. Yeah. And, and enters into the, authenticity and submits to that authenticity Mm -hmm. that he becomes king again yeah that's so good i like got chills and we we noticed that that change from where it went from i just can't wait to be king to that mentality of i don't want to be king or i can't be king happens right after that interaction with scar who is the satan figure who Mm -hmm. spreads lies right he's the Mm -hmm. accuser yeah we have that scene over the body of mufasa where he says this is your fault right you can never come home they will never forgive you you need to run and that's Mm -hmm. the same same lies that Satan tells us when right. we sin and we stand over the body of our king, right? right Christ crucified, oh. and says, this is your fault. Mm-hmm. You cannot be forgiven for this. Mm-hmm. You need to run. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what puts us in this mentality, like Gordon wow. was saying, of I can't do what I'm supposed to do anymore. Like I, right. I wanted to, but now I, I just can't. I'm too broken. Right. And so that's where we see that shift. And it's not until the queen, this Mary figure that you were bringing up, <laughs> Nala, comes back in. Isn't this crazy? It's yeah. so good. I know. So she false. comes in, and what fixes it is this love. But then there's also that scene where right after Simba rejects Nala, like mm-hmm. there's that, that love, he rejects her and says, I still can't do this. And then in comes Rafiki, the friend. Yes, the friend. I, think, I think he is the Christian figure of this entire thing, hands down. Okay. And this is why. So throughout the entire thing, he's always been faithful, right? Obviously, it's, it's like a, a pagan religion, but sure. he is he's faithful, right? Yeah. And he's always been like this this sage. And in this scene, he he comes in and he asks, uh, well, first Simba says, "Who are you?" Mm-hmm. And Rafiki says, "The real question is, who are you?" Yeah. Right. And so it's all about this identity where he's starting to like he's forgotten who he is. Mm -hmm. And he says, Simba says, I'm nobody. Just leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And that's when Rafiki says, no, you are the son of Mufasa. And we said Mufasa means king. You are the son of the king. And in saying this, he's he's reminding him who his identity is. Right. 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 And then he leads him to Mufasa. Yeah. He brings him to the puddle and they have this conversation. So it's like this Christian figure reminding you, you are the son of God, this yeah. king. And then he brings him to them and, and they have this conversation. So I'm just going to read it out real quick. Mufasa says, Simba, you must take your place in the circle of life. You must remember who you are, remember. the one true king. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> you are. As king, I was most proud of one thing having you as my son. And then Simba says, that was a long time ago. Mufasa, no Simba, 
that is who you are. And then as he's kind of leaving, Simba says, please don't leave me again. And Mufasa says, I never left you. I never will. Remember who you are. Remember. And Rafiki comes in. And so I ask you again, who are you? And Simba replies, I am Simba, the son of Mufasa, the son of, son of the king. Mm-hmm. And Rafiki here says, he lives within you. Mm. And so I just want to break down this conversation really quick because I think this totally. is this is it. Yeah. Right. So what are you guys' thoughts? So good. I mean, the whole time that was happening, that when I was watching it, like I said, I'm reading this book on the Holy Spirit. So all I could think about was the Spirit and that ultimately, like, that's what empowers us to claim our identity as daughters and sons. Uh, <laughs> and also, I'm like, why can't I just watch a movie like a normal person <laughs> without thinking about like Same. all these different things? Same. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's what I was thinking of. And and in, it's interesting hearing you kind of break that down and talk about Rafiki, the friend, and and just that he like kind of propels this into into existence. But I but think yeah, which is the Holy Spirit too, though. I, I think that's yeah. a, a good analogy too. Yeah, I just feel like um, it's like first of all, our Christian faith is all about remembering. It's like because sin is about forgetting who God is and forgetting who we are, and and so like the whole Christian project is remembering those two things, and it is the Holy Spirit who empowers us to do that. And it is, I mean, I love that you like broke this all down because it is it, it is the saints it is mary who mm-hmm. leads us to that spirit you know and and ultimately like accepting and embracing the great power and responsibility that comes with being a daughter or son of the king it's just yeah. all about remembering all about the spirit helping two, us so. two things came to mind for me like i kind of thought about the great commissioning because rafiki mm. like without rafiki Simba would have never come back from like being hanging out with Timon and Pumbaa. Mm -hmm. And so like Rafiki kind of helps guide him, but in the same way without Rafiki, Simba could not have helped Timon and Pumbaa. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, we have a guide, but then we also can become a guide to others. And it's, and then, and then trans and then, you know, Timon and Pumbaa once it's like this lie that like you said, Timon and Pumbaa became friends because they were broken and they were hurt and they probably thought they were the only ones that were broken and hurt. And so mm-hmm. they stuck together and they avoided everybody else. But when they finally realized and Simba's like, oh, I'm broken and hurt. And right. I found you guys. And then Rafiki's like, no, everyone's broken and hurt. And you yes. are greater than that. And Simba's like, oh, yeah. Hey, Timon and Pumbaa, everyone's broken and hurt. You're greater than that. <laughs> they're like, oh, yeah. And right. and it's and it, like it's that past- friendship that leads to the conversion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like even outside of like the truth. Obviously, like that friendship led into the truth and, and led into the, like them going back to save others, right? In that in that war with Scar, that's so good. Yeah. Oh, and then that. and then the other thing I thought about was with this conversation of something I heard this past week. Saint Francis of Assisi had this prayer where he would just stare at the crucifix and like open his arms and just pray, "Who are you? And who am I?" Mm-hmm. And that's what he would say. And like, that's what this conversation is. It's like, you have to know who the God, God, the father is, who the king is. And then he will tell us and remind us who our authentic Mm. selves are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. That's so good. Love, love, love. Yeah. And so right after this, this is where we see the true conversion happening, like Mm -hmm. like we mentioned. And so we, we have Simba returning to his identity, taking, taking back pride rock, right? Mm -hmm. This, This epic battle. And as he's journeying back, this is where we get into the Beyonce song, Spirit. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) the the first time I listened to this, I was just like, it sounds so repetitive. But then I started listening to the lyrics, like actually listening. And this is good. This is so good. Yeah. So we we were going long, but I'm loving this. So let's just keep going and see what happens. Let's just break down the lyrics a little bit. The first part's in Swahili, so I'm not even going to attempt that. I, I can tell you what it says. Great. It says, long live the king. Does it really? Yeah. Vivo Cristo Rey, technically. But uh, yeah, it's Swahili for long live the king. No way. Wow. Okay, well, that's sweet. <laughs> love that. Okay. Well, according to Lyric Genius, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, never wrong, so we're good. 
<laughs> yeah. Is it a verified annotation? Uh, it's got 27 <laughs> upvotes. <so. laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> okay, so so from that, this again, the song is called Spirit. It's by Beyonce, the queen herself, right? Truly. And the the first verse, we'll go first verse and then chorus here. So it says, and the wind is talking for the very first time with a melody that pulls you towards it, painting pictures of paradise, saying, rise up to the light in the sky. Yeah, watch the light lift your heart up, burn your flame through the night. Whoa, spirit, watch the heavens open. Yeah, spirit, can you hear it calling? So let's go ahead and just break it down from there in, in that first section. What do you all think? I mean, here's my thing. I never like to get super carried away with like imposing meaning that maybe wasn't intended, but I feel like <laughs> whether Beyonce intended it or not, Starting with talking about the wind talking. Yeah. Well, and it's, a song, it's a song called Spirit, too. Right, right. And then I, late, later on, it references the I am. So I'm pretty sure this is intentional. It, no, I know. But, like, I, I don't, I don't want to, like, here's what I, I meant by that. It's, like, I don't want to assume, like, a, a Catholic, oh, uh, okay. like, catechetical response from sure. this. Or presume that, I guess. But I, I, I won't be mad. <laughs> I'm sure they won't. But <laughs> I just want to respect like Beyonce's no, art and like it. would yeah. love to like know her um, intention with it all. But like uh, uh, listening to this as a Catholic, I can't deny. I mean, and I'm sure you agree that just the fact that like this is like this is the spirit, the way he moves. I mean, it's 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 the wild way of the spirit. It comes and it goes, and um, and and I love like the the whole thought of. The, a melody that pulls you towards it, painting pictures of paradise. Yes. I one of my things about the Lord and my imaginations of heaven is like very affected by music and melodies, and and so I just really appreciate that. Um, but that it is this thing that like pulls you out of yourself into something greater, a desire for paradise, and that 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 is what the Spirit does in our lives. It's this this wild wind that draws us into a desire for heaven and equips us to live for it to live it right now. So anyways, those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, I, I see in this verse, verse and pre-chorus, we have wind, music, images, light, and fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like all these things are things that we could say we can gain from the Holy Spirit. Or our or, symbols or, of the Holy Spirit, too. Exactly, yeah. Really? And, um, yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. Yeah. Let's go ahead and just dive into the next verse then. So oh. it says... And the water's crashing, trying to keep your head up high while you're trembling. That's when the magic happens. And the stars gather by by your side, saying, rise up to the light in the sky. Let the light lift your heart up, burn your flame through the night. And then we see the chorus again talking about the spirit. This, to me, reminded me of the song Oceans mm -hmm. a little bit, talking about the waters crashing around you keep your head up high and talking about like in that pain in that suffering in that drowning that's where the rescue happens and we get kind of this peter walking on water and then falling into the sea kind of thing where while you're trembling that's where the magic happens while we're broken while we're hurt that's when we tend to reach out the most and allow mm -hmm. god to to work on us mm-hmm yeah, I love that. I love it. I love it. Any other thoughts on that part? I didn't mean to steal everything. <laughs> no, that was so good. It was so, so good. I just think it's pretty ironic speak, thinking about that part and going back to Simone and Pumbaa and like it ends with and the stars gather by, by your side and like they're <laughs> drowning and stuff. And then just that conversation with the stars and stuff is just like being the saints. Right. But like the fact that they didn't see it that way and then like the yeah. stars are always with them and it's just... <laughs> a nice little circle yeah mm -hmm. that's good okay so yeah we have we have the chorus again and then we come into this this final verse chorus bridge all all the above and it says your destiny is coming close stand up and fight so go into that far off land and be one with the great i am i am boy becomes a man woe spirit watch the heavens open Spirit, can you hear it calling? 
Spirit, yeah, watch the heavens open. Spirit, spirit, can you hear it calling? Your destiny is coming close. Stand up and fight. So go into a far off land and be one with the great I am. Final thoughts. I love that destiny and oneness with the great I am yes. are linked to standing up and fighting. And and not in like, I, I'm not like a violent person. But I think <laughs> um, we talk so much about in, in our Christian circles about like, fighting the battle over good and evil and sin and grace and, and, and being committed to this battle. And it's hard. It, I mean, like I, I, I just love, and really what this whole story is about is about the accepting the hard destiny that we're mm. called to. And I think that that's just so much of like the Christian experience is like allowing God to be God is difficult because surrendering to his power and responding to it as he calls is so radically against what the world Mm -hmm. would settle for or would, would ask us to do. And so I love that like destiny is about fighting for something in order to become one with, with God, Um, because that is what it is. It is, it's, it's taking up arms in this battle against the enemy and relying on the saints and, um, and, angels who are protecting us but fighting for our destiny of heaven because that's what we're destined for yeah, that's, yeah. Right. that's good gordon you got anything i was just playing like my mind was like technically your destiny could be your vocation your calling in that way but mm-hmm. then just what you what you said like your destiny and the far off land being yeah. heaven yeah and so the coming close the standing up and fighting that's all our time on earth yeah and then where where we get to go to be one with the great I am would be in heaven. So that's like after, you know, the conquered death after we die and then are raised again. Mm. That's yeah. that's that's there. So think about that in contrast to the movie that yeah. like you just saw and then the song is played. It's it's a little different, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. a lot of meaning there. Yeah, and then I mean the go into the far off land. That's very much the uh, go and preach to all corners of the world, all nations and stuff like that too. So we have like this commissioning in a way too from that. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, that's an awesome fit to the movie. The last thing I had as far as my notes from, from the movie in general was when they come back to the pride lands, they see it just destroyed by scar and the hyenas. Also, mm-hmm. did you guys know that scar originally was supposed to be a baboon, not a lion? Fascinating. Yeah, mm-hmm. not relevant whatsoever, but I Very read that. So, yeah, they come back and they see, like, everything's just destroyed, right? And there's mm-hmm. death everywhere. I think there's even a line in this movie where they're, like, a little heavy on the carcasses, but other than that, it's a fixer yeah. upper, right? Yeah. And so we see this death, and this reminds me of, Gordon, I think we did an episode on this, actually, how evil is parasitic. It's not the opposite of good. It's It's a parasite off of good, and it's dependent on that. And mm-hmm. we, we noticed how they ran out of food. They mm-hmm. were starving. And the reason why they were starving was because they this evil was destroying everything. And it even destroys that which it's dependent on, which is life. Mm-hmm. right? And so we kind of see that opposite playing out. But mm-hmm. at the same time, during the final battle, we had the burning of the, the Pride Lands. right? Mm-hmm. And we see that from that burn... I don't know if you guys, you guys didn't really grow up in the Midwest, so this might be just a me thing, but we had like a controlled burn where you would burn the prairie Mm -hmm. so that stuff could grow back, right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. It's kind of like that you catastrophe that Tolkien talked Mm -hmm. about where from this bad thing, life is brought forth. Mm -hmm. So just kind of final thoughts on that maybe. I mean, my, my initial thought is just like the... The way, like, that, that is what we're, <laughs> this sounds so intense, but that's what we're called to as Christians, that, like, that if we are truly receptive of our destiny and and respond to becoming who God created us to be, that means engaging in this battle and being willing to, to like, burn those areas of our lives, of our hearts, and, and 
where death is and, and, and like, and knowing that that's not like, that's not our duty, but that's the power of, of God within us that like, right. he is the one who, who burns and redeems those. But yeah, I love that, that image of like the new life that can come from that because it is, it is like this process of tension of, of knowing that like we are sinners and we need our savior to burn the parts of our lives that where we have brought death. Um, mm-hmm. and, and like, if we're really running with this analogy, like Simba to a certain extent was responsible for the death that was brought there. And so, um, it was about receiving the power of his father, Mufasa, in order to go back and allow mm-hmm. that power to burn the death he had sown. And, and that's what, that's what brings new life. So, mm. And and it's painful and it it has that, it is, yeah. that battle and everything, but ultimately that's where hope hope lies. Right, right. right. So. As yeah. well as uh, you know, another Saint Saint Catherine of Siena says, you know, be who you are. Yeah. You will set the world on fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's like once you know, if if we understand who we are, just mm-hmm. like Simba finally did after speaking to his father again, mm-hmm. then we can come back and just like set set everything ablaze and get rid of the bad totally yeah cool well it looks like we are not going to have time to talk about halsey this time uh, <laughs> my but, queen. yeah maybe maybe we can we can do another show in the future and we can we can talk cool. about her that'd be fun this has um, been a delight cool well, we're happy we're happy that you're you're doing it with us this is a lot yeah. of fun we want to go and lead into challenges gordon do you do you have one? Oh, i'm putting you, you on the just, spot bro uh just you do you guys no <laughs> no love that no anti-challenge it's an anti-challenge oh my gosh <laughs> no i don't i don't really, i mean there's a ton of things but i feel like you probably have something so i have one so i was, I was just thinking a lot of actually maybe two so the first one will say really focus on your calling this week so we talked a lot in this episode about our identity uh, mm. so take that to prayer what is your identity what is your calling what is the mission the commissioning that you are being sent on right figure out what that is and that's going to be a lot of discernment that might not be something you figure out this week but maybe start that process maybe find a spiritual director because that could help a lot and then the number two is to act on that right we're all called to be missionaries in some way so find someone that you can really in- invest in and it doesn't have to be someone who's across the world, find someone right next to you that you can really invest in. Uh, maybe that's a family member. Maybe that's a friend. Maybe that's a Timon and Pumbaa. I don't know. But uh, figure out who that is for you and, and make it happen. I would add on to that. I'll make your steps two and three. And actually step one would be, because I don't know where you might be at, finding out who the king is. Mm. Like asking who, who the father is first in order to figure out like who you are and what your calling is. And even if that's all you do is step one, just getting, getting to know that that's know father. King. Mm-hmm. Leah, do you have any okay. challenges to add on top Me of too. those three? Great. Yes, this is my challenge because this is the challenge I'm giving myself. <laughs> like ask, not like, ask for the <laughs> Holy Spirit. Ask for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life because the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit raise Jesus from the dead, raise people from the dead, heals people left and right. Ask for the Holy Spirit and expect mm. him to move in your life. And and that might sound like it's not very practical, but it, it truly is. Like the Holy Spirit's a person and we can be in relationship with the Spirit and the Spirit empowers us to do what Jesus did, to be Jesus. So ask for the Spirit and, and for the grace to respond to the Spirit because yeah. that's what gives us the power to respond to those identity pieces to who God the father is. So ask for the spirit, live in relationship with him. That's Amen. Awesome. Yeah. And guys, those four challenges might seem a little overwhelming, but in reality, they're, they're all connected, right? If you yeah. do one, it should lead into the other, mm-hmm. the other four. So just keep that in mind. If you're doing one, they all, they all go together. Truly. So with that, do you guys have any shout outs? So, can I just shout out anyone? Because I could go on for days. We yeah. shout out so many yeah. people on this show. <laughs> Even if you know they don't listen to it. Yeah. yeah. We oh gave a God. shout out to, uh, shout to out Joel your mom. last week. Joel. And there's no, Joel Stepanek. There's no yeah. way he listens. Oh my gosh. I don't know about that. Well, I'll shout out Joel again this week and my whole <laughs> team at Life Teen. I yes. work with the best. Jessica, Elizabeth, Amanda, Jose, Selena, Ryan, Stephanie. 
my dream team and the Life Teen Apprentices. They're just incredible. This year we have three with us, Hannah, Kelsey, and Brendan. Also, I'll shout out my family, mom, dad, Mayor, Kel, Endless Love. I think that's all. Nice. And I'll shout out Halsey, of course. Too. Hey, <laughs> she definitely listens. I asked her. Yes. And Ryan McQuaid. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon, do you have any this week? Yeah, I want to shout out. Um, I was on retreat in Fort Worth last week, and a teen, his name is Leo, he was actually telling me he loves to read. He's read like 26 books just this summer. Wait, his name is Leo? Yeah. As in Lion? Sure. Ah! <laughs> but he, he's telling me how he loves, I don't remember what it was called, some certain type of fiction, but like where it points you back to Christ. And cool. I, so it was the first time ever in ministry I told him about my podcast, and hey. that's just not something I do. I'll shout out Paul Latino and Dan, who were at AYC this past weekend. Um, who <gasps> I, also, I was not, but I no. went on Saturday night to see my kids and took pizza, so I yeah. sort of was there. You know AYC? I just know some people who were there. Uh, uh, I'll shout out Katie Prejean. And, yeah, Katie. Yeah, I, I knew a couple of the musicians, but yeah. Keep and then down. lastly, uh, Nick Longo, who Nick uh, Longo, a pal. Yeah, he uh, he he's the whole reason I think this happened, right? Yeah, we had a couple. Oh, so yeah. he's he's the one on Twitter who said that you should do this as a as a video, and yes. uh, I I totally stole it. And we're Which I'm doing so it here instead. Videos are on hold at the moment, so great. great. Mm. Yeah, and then there was there was a Mary Beth that was a part of that conversation too. So yes. I don't know if she. If she was was asking us to do this but and then another person asked us to do lion king a while ago so that's Catherine wow. montgenay so shout okay. out to all of them for making this possible amazing so, so yeah. good. with that do you want to let people know where they can find you leah where can they find yes. you on social media life teen stuff like that yeah well y'all should follow life teens twitter instagram and youtube subscribe to our youtube channel um that's where we have a lot of like what i'm working on with my job that's not following me directly but there's a lot of cool stuff there but then i'm sure. on twitter and instagram i am leah murphy because that that's the handle um <laughs> the are fun but yeah that's where you can find me twitter's probably the best to like connect but yeah i'm just flouncing around and loving loving this life so that's where i'm at at cool. I am Leah Murphy. <laughs> and if you guys forget, that will be in the notes section as well. And it's a pretty, pretty easy one to remember, but just in case, check Thank below. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> like, share, <or> subscribe. <laughs> for sure. This has been delightful. Thank uh, you yes, very much. Thank you so much for being on. Oh, yeah. it was a joy. I'm really grateful y'all asked. Thank you. All right, guys. So with that, thank you for joining us in the adventure this week, and we will see you soon. Bye. Hey, guys. Just we just wanted to say thank you once again. We had a blast recording with Leah Murphy. It was and so just- much fun kind of going over and over in time i want to remind you once again that if you loved this if you want to learn more about what she does more about life teen or just where you can find her like like we mentioned earlier those will be in the show notes below just open up your podcasting app and scroll and also if this is your first time if if you kind of knew knew leah and never heard of us and you found us that way or or if you're a long-time listener you know and you know maybe we can get numb to things what we do as as this podcast is we take media like The Lion King, like movies or that song that Beyonce sings. So songs, movies, books, TV shows, just art. any part of culture. Yes. And we just kind of want to like remind you that in all this, kind of like what Leah was saying, like, you know, within the fortnight from last week, all this, these things actually do have hints of God, hints of the greater, even if it appears as a false God. And right. we just want to point those out and the lack thereof and, and, and guide that conversation back to the back great to I am. And like we mentioned in this, in the end, you know, this was something that was recommended, someone that people wanted to hear. So if there's something you're like, oh, that's interesting. Well, where's Christ in this? I've never, I could, I couldn't even think, start to begin, throw it at us and we'd love to break it down. And you can let us know those things in a lot of different ways. You can email us at 
thechristinculture at gmail.com. You can also find us on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook right now. Twitter, our handle is at ontheadventure2, and Facebook is just our name, The Christ and Culture. Uh, you can find us on SoundCloud. You can find us on Google Play, iTunes, really anything that plays podcasts. So check us out. Enjoy it. Share us with your friends. We also have a website if you want to find our blog. You can get the podcast, our videos from YouTube, all that stuff on our website. The website is thechristinculture.com. And if you enjoy what we're doing and you want to be a part of it and you want to support it and maybe get some bonus content, become a patron. You can go to patreon.com and find us there under the Christ and Culture and support us. For a couple bucks a month, you can get extra content and support what we're doing. And it all goes back into making this a better show. So with that, thank you guys. We appreciate you so much. We're praying for you and we love you. And we'll talk to you soon. See you next week. <laughs>